Hi guys, uh, what you're looking at here is a flyer that was created by Joseph H. Hazelton. He was an eyewitness to the uh, Lincoln assassination. Uh, he had these printed up and he passed them out when he did uh, interviews and things like that. And uh, he signed it right here, as you can see. Signature. Uh, he was a little boy uh, during the... Uh, assassination. He worked at uh, Ford's Theater. He met uh, John Wilkes Booth and he tells the story of that here. Uh, plus he also adds what happened after the assassination which uh, would have been uh, third hand to him and a controversial story as to what happened to John Wilkes Booth. So you'll see that in the upcoming uh, video I put together. But anyway uh, this is kind of interesting. This was given to me by a friend of mine who uh, assumed I was interested in the Civil War and and uh, Abraham Lincoln and that kind of thing, and I can't imagine why. But um, what is uh, this was? Uh, he had a connection to John Bowles, who was a, a Hollywood actor, uh, and uh, apparently Joseph H. Hazelton uh, had this. It says right there for John Bowles scrapbook. Uh, they were both Hollywood actors, and he'll explain that in the uh, video coming up. But uh, uh, that's how I acquired it, and uh, it's kind of interesting, so I kind of did a little research and put together some things, uh, some photos uh, that tie into the story. So um, I guess I'll just show it to you. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy it. Joseph H. Hazelton, veteran actor, now in his 80th year, who was program boy at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. when President Lincoln was assassinated and witnessed the actual shooting, will give his vivid description of that tragic event. Presenting Joseph H. Hazelton. On the 14th of April, 1865, a little schoolboy with his books in a strap, thrown carelessly across his shoulder, romped down 10th Street in Washington, D.C. And as he approached Old Ford's Theater, they stood in front a tall, stately man, swarthy of complexion, raven black curly hair, a drooping mustache, and a wondrous kind eye. That man was John Wilkes Booth, who for the act of a madman, that night swayed the destiny of our nation. The little schoolboy was myself. It was a wonderful thing for my little companions and myself speak to Booth or have him speak to us. We looked up to him as something beyond the ordinary. And as I started to pass, I touched my cap, said, how do you do, Mr. Booth? With a smile, he beckoned me over to him, lifted my cap from my head, ran his fingers through my hair, said, well, little man, you're going to be an actor someday. I replied, I don't know, Mr. Booth, maybe. I was program boy in the house at the time. In fact, errand boy. Little did I dream then that I would spend 60 years of my life in the theatrical profession, which I have. Booth went down in his pocket and he took out a little folder that contained the script, coin of the day, commonly known as shin plasters. Taking off a ten cent shin plaster, he pressed it into my hand, pulled my cap playfully down over my eyes, patted me on the shoulder, bade me go buy myself something. 
have often wondered in the many intervening years whether that man had the terrible crime of that night on his mind when speaking to an innocent little schoolboy. Well, as was my custom, that night I went around the theatre to hand out the programmes. It was a gala night. The play was our American cousin. Laura Keane was the star, and it was her benefit night. Everyone knew the president would be there. The paper had spoken of it throughout the week. The house was packed from pit to dawn. The gold lace of the army and navy predominating to some extent. The president's party came late. The second act was on. In the party was Mr. Lincoln, Mrs. Lincoln, Surgeon General Barnes, and Miss Harris, daughter of Senator Harris. And as the party entered the theater, the orchestra played hail to the chief. The audience rose in mass and cheered. President Lincoln came down to the edge of the box and with that sad, sweet smile that he was wont to wear on such occasions, bowed his acknowledgments and the play went on. I was standing looking directly up at the President's box, smiling when he smiled, all enraptured with that wonderful face. He was an idol to me. I happened to turn my eyes to the right, to the main entrance, I saw Wilkes Booth enter. He spoke to Mr. Buckingham, the doorkeeper, for a few moments. I marveled at the change in his costume. When he spoke to me in the afternoon, he was faultlessly dressed in the picturesque costume of the day. Velvet collar and cuffs, ruffled shirt. Now he had on heavy cavalry boots, spurs, blue army shirt and a slouched army hat. As he went up the steps to the right, towards the dress circle, and then towards the president's box, I wondered in my childish way what he could be doing there in such a garb on such an auspicious occasion. I didn't have long to wait. There was a flash and a report. President Lincoln had been assassinated. There are not words enough in the vocabulary of the English language to describe the awful hush fell over that house when the shot was fired. Everyone seemed to realize that something terrible had happened, but no one seemed to take the initiative till Laura Keene, coming from her dressing room, ran down to the edge of the stage and cried out, Ladies and gentlemen, the president's been shot by John Wilkes Booth. Then all was pandemonium. When Booth fired the shot from a sim uh, single-barreled weapon, commonly known as a derringer, he dropped the weapon and drew a knife. Surgeon General Barnes attempted to stop him and received an ugly gash in the arm. Booth got to the edge of the box, leaped over. As he did so, his spur caught in the flag that draped the box. He tripped and fell to the stage. Now history says he broke his leg. Such is not the case. Had Booth have broken his leg, he never in the world could have gotten across that 60 foot of stage. However, he did fracture the small bones in his foot. I shall never forget to my dying day the look of anguish and despair on that man's face as he half dragged and half limped to the center of the stage with a wild, maniacal stare, brandished the knife above his head and cried out, Six Emperor Tyrannus! Thus perished tyrants. He managed to get out to the stage entrance, mounted his horse and drove away. At Eastern Branch, he was joined by young Harold, the youngest of the conspirators, and also by a third party, which history does not record. They managed to get to Port Tobacco, where Dr. Mudd set the small bones in Booth's foot. Then the three got a boat and went across the Potomac. <coughs> when they got on the other side, they found an old colored man driving a wagon. It was raining. And was covered, the furniture in the wagon was covered with tarpaulin. They paid this old colored man to drive them to the Rappahannock Ferry, a flatboat ferry. They got across the Rappahannock River and went up to the home of Mr. Garrett, Charles Garrett in Rappahannock County. There they asked for shelter. They could not get into the house, but Mr. Garrett told them they might be sheltered in the barn. Understand it was a a tobacco barn, not a hay barn. 
When Booth got into this barn, he discovered that he dropped some papers in getting out of the wagon. And he sent his third man, Rudy, back to get them. When Rudy was gone, Booth said to young Harold, there's no use of us sticking together. We'll be caught. I'm going to escape and get to Norfolk, make a trip to South America if I can get a ship, which he did. He came back to America three years afterwards. And from pillar to post, he budded through the country, always seemingly well supplied with money. 1903, a man by the name of St. Helen, who really was Booth, as has since been proved, committed suicide by taking 16 grains of arsenic, enough to kill a regiment, in fact. And on his deathbed, he confessed that he was Booth to a priest and to a number of the citizens in the town, one of whom to, I have talked to since then. I understand that his own sister, when this question was mooted in 1903, made an affidavit that her brother came back when he said he did three years after the assassination and stayed 10 days at her home in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. So it's a pretty well satisfied fact to the government that they did not get Booth, that he was not shot by Boston Corbett. But we leave Booth and we'll go back to the theater. They lifted the president tenderly up again, took him across to the home of Mr. Peterson, one of our merchants. Mr. Peterson had a small house and a large family. And the only available space was a little hall bedroom in the rear, almost under the steps that led to the second floor. But it was any port in a storm. They took the president in, put him tenderly to bed, sent for his family, his private physician, Dr. Stone, and the vigil of the night wore on. Gray dawn was just streaking through the windows of that little home on 10th Street on the morning of the 15th of April, when Dr. Stone, holding the president's hand and feeling the pulse, that lifeblood that was fast ebbing away, said to Secretary Edward M. Stanton, who stood with tear-stained cheeks at the foot of the bed, Mr. Secretary, what is the time? Secretary Stanton, taking out his watch, replied, 22 minutes past seven. Then Dr. Stone, placing the president's hand gently across his breast, sighed out, the president is dead. Then Secretary Stanton uttered that famous remark that'll go thundering down through the corridors of time. Now he belongs to the ages. And when the spirit of that mighty man sawed its way to that bourne from which no traveler returns, it served to weld a link of steel between the north and the south, making it one grand and beautiful nation that stood in 65 as it stands today, with outstretched arms, to welcome the oppressed from other shores to come and build their homes here in free America. But it also stands today as it stood in 65 when our martyred president met his doom, ready at all hazards, by force of arms if necessary, to protect its honor, its integrity and its flag, the flag of the greatest nation on earth, the United States of America. Mr. Hazelton has an attractive leaflet made of this address with a portrait of himself and personally autographed and would be pleased to mail a copy to anyone desiring it if you'll send your address and any small contribution to cover the actual cost of production and postage. Address, Joseph H. Hazelton, 5353 Virginia Avenue, Hollywood, California. Or address Mr. Hazelton to the station to which you are now listening. <laughs> 